Hello and welcome back to ESC 418A. This is Lecture 10, Visual Communication. Today we're talking about figures that will go into a report or a presentation. So I'll go through some general best practices, both for reports and presentations, and then I'll go through these types of figures. In a technical report, you might find any or all of these types of figures, excluding the last few, which are more for presentations. So we would have a map to show the location of our site, conceptual models to show some process or mechanism that we want to explain, graphs to show our data, photographs often to show our site or maybe our laboratory experimental setup, flowcharts to show processes, mind maps which show complex ideas broken down into small parts, and then we might have animations or videos showing some process or in the case that I'll show today a result of some numerical model. There are also scale models, which are good for small presentations. And then I'll get into virtual reality, though it's certainly not my area of expertise. It's an emerging area that is very effective for presenting types of information, especially for landscapes and other types of things that don't exist yet that are going to be built in the future. And we want to give people a full understanding of what they might look like. So here are some general best practices for report figures. The first is probably the most important. Use the simplest figure that will convey the necessary information. Don't overcomplicate your figures. It will just confuse your readers and it will detract from what you actually want to get across. If the figure is not your own, make sure you cite it properly. Use consistent fonts. We often see reports that have several different fonts in each of the different figures and a large technical report can have upwards of 50 figures. Sometimes these are all created by different people using different programs. So for example, you'll have some maps created by a drafting group, some Excel charts created by the person who's analyzed the data, maybe some statistical charts created in R or SPSS or some other program. And all of these end up looking quite different. And when they're all put into the same report, it ends up really detracting from the quality of the report. So be careful to follow a style guide if there is one. And if not, try and create sort of an informal style guide for your own document, keeping track of the fonts, the sizes, or the other elements of the look of each of your figures to try and keep them all consistent within a single document. In the text, make sure you refer to your figure. Refer to it by number. If you haven't referred to your figure, your reader will have a hard time understanding not only what your figure means, but why it's there in the first place. It'll really detract from the quality of your report. Place the figure soon after it's mentioned in the text. If it doesn't fit on the same page, try and insert it on the next page. The exception here is large figures, so 11 by 17 or even larger figures sometimes go at the end of the report. Explain the details of your figure in a caption. Give the reader enough information that they can look at the figure, maybe look at a footnote or a caption that is one to three lines long that explains some of the details on the figure. If your caption is longer than that, it's probably too complicated of a figure and maybe you should break it into two separate figures. During the editing process, so at the end of your review, of your self-review or reviewing somebody else's report, double check all the numbering, check that every figure has been referred to in the text and that the figures follow the references. Here's some general best practices for presentation figures. A lot of the best practices that I just spoke about for reports also apply to presentations, but these ones are really specific to presentations. Consider your audience, especially when you're tailoring your introduction. If your audience does not have a lot of knowledge of your topic, they will require a lot of good figures and a lot of good explanation right at the start to bring them up to speed. If they're reading a report, of course you need to consider your audience. But in a report, your audience has an opportunity to go and look things up, to pause their reading, to go back and reread. Whereas in a presentation, if you've lost them in your introduction, you've lost them for the entire presentation. There's no opportunity for your audience to hit pause, go and look something up, to try and understand it better, and then to come back and watch your presentation. Unless, of course, it's pre-recorded. But in general, you really want to make sure that your audience is going to understand your introduction in the background, and all of the necessary prerequisite information before getting into the details of your presentation. So use a lot of figures and a little text. You'll see it in this presentation, I'm going to use a lot of figures, not much text. Although you've probably noticed the first nine lectures are mostly text. Of course, that's because this is for a writing course. However, in a general presentation, 
to a scientific community, I would tend to use about three quarters figures and maybe a quarter of my slides would have text, but I try and keep as much as I can slides that only contain figures. They're a lot more interesting for the audience and they don't distract people. So if I'm speaking right now and I'm not saying exactly what's on my slide, it can be quite difficult for you to follow, I imagine, if I start launching off onto some other topic. If you're still reading the text on my slide, it's going to be very difficult for you to follow along. However, if I'm explaining a figure, it's quite easy for you as the audience to follow along on the figure as I'm speaking. Now, sometimes we need to have a lot of text because our presentation might become a handout or it might be given to somebody who isn't available to hear our, our talk. But in that case, we can use the notes feature of PowerPoint and have a separate slide for notes. Consider the PDF and printed version. If our presentation is printed off, have we used colors that will no longer distinguish what we're trying to show if it's printed in black and white? And then use larger fonts than you would in a report. Try not to just take a figure that was produced for a report, copy and paste it into a presentation and assume that that format will still be fine. Often you'll want to increase the font size, maybe make your borders thicker, try and make things stand out because it will be a different format. And again, that depends on the projector that you'll be using and other factors that you need to consider. Okay, so let's talk about some specific types of figures. The first type of figure in a scientific, especially in an environmental or an earth science scientific report will be a map. We want to know where a sample was located, where some field work was done, where our study area is, and for that we'll need a map, usually a couple of maps. If possible, combine a couple of maps into one, as is shown here. So in this map, we have a greater area shown in an inset, and for reference, you can see Great Slave Lake. And so most people will know where Great Slave Lake is if they're, in, if they're reading this report in the first place. So this kind of shows where is the overall area that we're interested in. And then we zoom in and look at the study site showing specific lakes and flow paths. So make sure you include a legend. Even on a simple figure, it's not always obvious what an arrow might mean. If you look at this, you might intuitively know that those arrows represent the flow of water. However, it could also be a wind pattern, it could be a caribou migration route. You really don't know unless there's a legend included. So include a scale bar, otherwise it's really impossible for the reader to understand what scale they're looking at unless they're very familiar with your study area already, in which case they're not going to be looking at your maps. The people who are looking at your maps are the people who really aren't that familiar with your area. Include coordinates so that somebody can go look it up in Google Earth or some other format. Perhaps the most important thing about maps is only include necessary information. A lot of maps have way too much information and it's really hard to understand what is the key information that you need to get from this map if you've got 30 different layers of useless information shown. So I'm going to spend some time on conceptual models. Conceptual models come in many different forms. They're typically used to show complex processes or mechanisms of which there are many in environmental science. Almost everything that we care about follows some complex process in environmental science. There's lots of different formats available. Keep in mind that even if you have a really good conceptual model figure in your report, you still need to explain it really well in your text. So the text description and the figure need to go hand in hand. So I'll start with this very simple classic conceptual model. This is the classic risk assessment model from the US EPA. We start with some stressor. In this case, it's a pesticide. So the pesticide can go through different sources and exposure media to get it into the environment. We then move on to receptors. So these are essentially living things. And then we attribute change to those receptors. So what can happen to them? Can they have a change in survival, growth, reproduction? Can it affect the food chain, etc., etc.? So this is a fairly standard way of looking at a conceptual model going from source to receptor. This one is similar. This is also from the US EPA. This is a fairly high level or generic overview of the sediment water exchange. So we have organic matter exchanging with the sediment and the water, moving from phase to phase, going from particulate to dissolved. So we have different processes going on, mixing, sedimentation, diffusion. There's not a lot of detail here. This is really just high level to show how these fit together. If we want to get into more detail, we have a figure like this that starts to get into the chemical reactions, showing bubbles being produced, sediments being resuspended in the water, and exchange with the atmosphere. And again, we can go one level of detail further 
showing the detailed chemical reactions that are occurring with carbon, nitrogen, and sulfur. We have redox reactions, dissolution, diffusion, and bubble formation and release to the water column. So all of these are showing pretty much the same thing, it's just different levels of detail. And all of these have a few common elements. Number one is they have very rough or high level overview of the spatial distribution. So in other words, we have a cutaway view showing the water column, but we're not actually showing any water, we're just showing that as a big box. We have an upper layer of sediment and a lower layer of sediment, also just shown as boxes. So these have some element of spatial realism because of course the sediment and the water are arranged this way, but they're not intended to be images or realistic looks of what the water and sediment look like. In contrast, we have a cutaway conceptual model like this that is intended to give some idea about what those different media look like. So this is a groundwater and aquifer cutaway. We'll see these a lot when we're looking at hydrogeology and groundwater flow paths. We can see the groundwater flowing through different media. In this case, it's a backfilled mine showing the source, which is the tailings and the receptor, which is a lake, and we're showing how the water can get from the mine to the lake. This is a different type of uh, conceptual model. This is a process flow diagram. So this is showing a plan view. So from above, we're looking at a generic mine. And again, we're showing how tailings can get to the receiving environment. Although we're not showing the cutaway view now, it's just showing what are the different compositions of water that make up the overall seepage that can reach the environment. So again, showing some fairly similar types of information, but showing it in a different way, because here we're trying to emphasize the types of water, whereas in the previous conceptual model, we were trying to emphasize the flow paths. So the point here is have a look at what you're trying to represent and choose the format that will best represent that, because there are lots of different types of conceptual models that you can choose from. If you have access to GIS, you can get a little bit more sophisticated in your backgrounds. So this is a GIS version of another similar process. This is mine water with a tailings facility showing how that tailings water interacts with the environment. But now we're using a digital elevation model overlaid by satellite imagery as our background. And that really helps us visualize how all of these mine waters come together. And that really helps us visualize what this might actually look like in reality. This is another GIS-based conceptual model, again, showing another mine with its waters interacting with the environment. This is showing a water treatment plant with a pipeline, and this one is not to scale. It's not an actual satellite image. It's been sketched to look like a satellite image, but it really helps us convey a lot of information in a very small space. Using this type of format can really help the audience understand what you're trying to convey. Again, here's a very complex conceptual model showing some fairly realistic landscapes with cutaways on the bottom and we have multiple processes going on on the right. We have the same classic source pathway receptor format going on but within that spatially realistic cutaway view. Similarly we have a global scale process illustrated with the same type of figure. We have cutaway views showing the groundwater and atmospheric water interacting with the earth. We have a fairly realistic looking landscape showing the surface processes interacting with the ocean. And we have the same thing on the left and the right. Whereas on the left, we're showing the overall water balance. On the right, we're showing the nutrient balance. So we can show some very complex global processes by just showing a small cutaway of the landscape. Okay, let's look at some graphs. There are lots of different types of graphs that you can choose. We would use time series, scatter plots, bar charts, pie charts, correlation graphs like this one. So I won't go through all the different types of formats, but I'll just give a couple of best practices. So choose your format carefully. Try not to always just use the same format because you're used to doing scatter plots or bar charts or what have you. Look at all the different formats available to you and choose the one that's really going to represent your information. Make sure it's really clearly labeled. I've shown one on the right here that has a bunch of jargon on it. So if you have jargon like that, make sure you've defined it in your caption. And again, I've kind of given a rule of thumb of a caption being one to three lines long. If you get a five or six or seven line long caption, it's really difficult for the reader to process that information. So if you have any acronyms or jargon on your graph, explain it in the caption for somebody who might not be familiar with it. 
Keep your caption short if you can. Always double check your units. One of the most common things we see wrong with graphs is that they're either missing units or the units don't line up. You've got different units for different types of information. So be really careful with that. It's really difficult for people to have to look at a graph and do unit conversions in their head to try and understand the data. Photographs. These are fairly straightforward. You'll often have a photograph of the site you're studying or your laboratory setup or something else that you want to explain. And it's much easier to explain it if you can refer to a photograph. So explain the photo in the caption and provide the orientation. So if you're looking north, south, what have you, explain which direction you're looking in your photograph. Flowcharts can be really helpful for explaining a complex process. This flowchart is showing some computer code that triggers automatic sampling devices. So when a storm comes, it triggers an instrument that triggers another instrument to start collecting samples. Then it uploads the data to the web and it triggers additional instruments. If I were just to explain this in the text, I think it would be very difficult to follow all of the different processes that are going along. But if you glance at this flowchart periodically as you're reading the text, it's much easier for you to sort of reset your brain. Okay, this is where I am in the process. This is the decision that will make something either turn on or off or send data to one place or another. And this is where I'll end up at the end of the flowchart. If you're doing a flowchart, make sure you walk through the logic several times thinking about what can happen. Have you included all of the relevant decisions? Is there anything that puts you into an endless loop? Are there exits that you haven't thought of? So it can actually be quite a challenge to do a flowchart that considers all of the possible scenarios that can occur. Mind maps. We don't see these too often in technical reports, but when they are included, they can be very helpful. What they do is they break information down into smaller pieces. It doesn't have to be broken down chronologically. It's really any sort of a logical breakdown that you can think of. Anything that makes sense and will help your reader understand what you're trying to convey. So in this case, I've shown a mind map of how to write a great technical report. And as you can see, it's broken down by category, and the categories are not necessarily chronological. Some of them are, so I'll just go through them quickly. So if we go on the right, Break it into small tasks. These are really the high-level tasks that are involved in writing a technical report. So we have the next level, which is outline, draft, revise, and edit. These are the four major steps we take. I've broken revise down into modify, rearrange, and add information. I've broken edit down into the different types of things that we'll edit for. So we'll want to edit for clarity, conciseness, coherence, grammar, and typos. And I've further broken down a few of these categories into smaller categories. So conciseness, what do we mean by conciseness? We mean we have no fluff in our report, there's no repetition, and no redundancies. And you can keep breaking these down further. I could have broken down others as well. So for example, under outline, I might break that down into introduction, methods, results, and discussion. You could keep breaking it down further to show your whole outline. Whatever works for you, the point of a mind map is to help you think things through and then to communicate it to other people. So I've just shown you the steps involved. Now, going on the left, there are some sort of best practices or good things to do that aren't necessarily chronological. So seek review. That includes self-review, peer review, and senior review. Have some fun. Take breaks so that none of these steps becomes really too onerous. And celebrate small wins. So after your outline is done, take a break and celebrate. After your draft is done, celebrate that you've got all your text done. Lastly, understand your material. Make sure you've done your research and reread your literature. So again, these aren't necessarily chronological. We might do all of our research, reread your literature as part of the outline, drafting, revising, or editing stage. We might go back and iteratively do these things. It doesn't really matter. The point is that a mind map can break down all of these thoughts or concepts into smaller pieces of information to help make it more clear. Scale models. Scale models can be really fun. The lady shown in this photograph is named Patty Amison. She completed her PGO in the EAST program at UBC, so she's an alumnus of the program. Although she did her bachelor's degree at the University of Calgary, same as me, so she's a former alumnus of both you and I, interestingly. So scale models can be highly informative, highly engaging, and especially good for small audiences. And you can see the big smile on Patty's face here. She's really excited to show her scale model. And most people are when they have scale models because scale models are super cool and they get lots of information across. Again, I'm going to emphasize these are good for small audiences. They're not great for 
say, a lecture hall of 300 people unless you have a camera zoomed in on it. But why they're so good is because you can show real processes happening at a scale that people can understand. So this is basically a fish tank filled with sand, and it has some wells in it. You can inject water in, and I'm not sure if you can read these labels, but it says unconfined aquifer, aquitard, artesian well, stream. So you can show these large physical features in a small fish tank just by putting the water through them. You can use dyes to show where the water's going. You can draw water out of the wells. They're super cool, super fun, and super informative. That's the best part, is you can get a lot of information across much easier than if you were to, for example, speak to a large audience of lay people who don't necessarily understand what an unconfined aquifer is and to try and explain to them how water would move through one aquifer or another. It's so much easier to show them in real time. Similarly, this is a scale model of a 3D printed surface. These are becoming more common as well. Now that 3D printing technology is fairly readily available, you can print off mountain ranges, rivers, lakes, streams, aquifers, really anything that you can conceive of, you can get printed off at a scale that people can look at and really understand the landscape much better than any photograph or explanation could possibly give them. Another type of figure we have is animations, and I'm gonna switch over to the video for this. So for example, this is an animation produced by a water quality model. This model combines numerical code with GIS to show where water currents are at any given time and location in the lake. We can zoom in here to show finer scale details of what the water currents are doing given certain wind conditions. Now, of course, this isn't 100% accurate, but it's a really good representation that helps us understand what the current might be like. And the animation is much more powerful than say providing a whole bunch of time series graphs at different locations and trying to explain what the current might be doing at any given time or location. So we can zoom in to multiple scales, we can look at different types of currents, different areas, we can also do this with water concentrations, we can do this with a number of different variables that we care about in the lake. There are lots of different models like this available, there are models of all sorts of different physical processes that we care about, and they combine GIS with underlying numerical codes to give us the information that really is much more deeper and much more intuitive than having to interpret large reams of table data or graphs or other formats. And lastly, I'll just talk about virtual reality. Virtual reality is not just for gaming anymore. It's becoming much more common in environmental science and earth science particularly when we're looking at large landscape projects where some change is going to occur and we can use virtual reality to walk through that landscape, something that we couldn't possibly explain or show in a photograph the same way we can with a virtual reality headset. So anything that doesn't yet exist, something that's constructed or reclaimed or will be in the future, and also things that are either too small or too large. So you could do a virtual reality tour of outer space, you can do a virtual reality tour of your bloodstream. Any of these different media that we can simulate using digital landscapes, we can then explore using virtual reality. These are becoming more common. I've put a link on the course page to an earth science application of this, and I think we'll be seeing a lot more virtual reality in the future. So that's it for figures. Remember some of the key points for reports, Always use the simplest figure you can to show the information you need to show. Always refer to your figures from the text and double check at the end of your editing process that you've numbered everything correctly, that your figures appear after the reference from the text, but not too far after. And in presentations, the key points are use lots of figures, use consistent types of figures, use only as much text as is necessary. And if you can, try and have some fun with your figures. Okay, see you in lecture 11.